Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Canola harvest is starting to wind down. We'll begin our show with an update plus take a look at what's next for growers. We're joined now by our cropping system specialist Josh Lofton who's just now getting off of his tractor. We're here in his research plot. Josh, let's kind of start today with a look at how canola harvest is going. Well, canola harvest is doing real well. We're getting real close to the end. Um, a lot of growers are practically done. Um, if, if folks aren't done by the end of the week, something went wrong, they ran into a field that had a whole lot of moisture in it or uh, combines broke down or something along those lines. But other than that, by the end of the week, we should be uh, virtually done harvesting canola. And let's talk a little bit about the crop especially compared from from this time last year we're in pretty good shape uh, this time last year two years ago three i mean this is probably one of the the better crops uh, we've pulled off in a long time um, there's there's not a producer that i uh, i've talked to that haven't been uh, exceptionally happy with what they've been pulling off um, there there's always going to be really good fields and there's always going to be really bad fields but for, from a from a farm average if you will everything's been really really good and, and we're hoping for it to continue this week so the yields are pretty good do you have some perspective on that yeah we're, we're not hearing a whole lot of things under under 30 um, there there's obviously going to be some fields that are in that 20 range however last year when we were pulling off things in the single digits uh, th that that's going to be very unexpected this year and we we hope to have a lot more of the things in the 30 to 40 bushel range is what we're kind of hoping for okay let's switch gears and talk about double cropping tell us where we are and what you're getting set up kind of as we speak exactly uh, well when it when it comes time to harvest there's always it's time to start thinking about the next crop for some for some growers it's going to be next year next fall maybe even next summer uh, for a lot of folks here in the state um, double crop is the next crop and uh, we always uh, tell guys to, to look at soil moisture after you harvest to determine whether or whether or not to to double crop the thing of it is is that the reason why we've been blocked from the field from harvest is the benefit of double crop we have soil moisture th throughout the state there's not going to be a whole lot of growers around the state that are going to be lacking in soil moisture and so double crop is a very nice uh, alter alternate system for this year um, the the benefit with double crop here in the states we got a lot of options um, soybeans are always going to be your standby it's going to be the thing that everybody thinks of when they talk about double crop east of i-35 that's a really good option even some guys west of 35 that's still a really good thing for them especially ones that have water if a grower has water they can get by a lot with a lot more east or west of 35 than some um, for the other folks that are west of 35 we have two other good options grain sorghum sesame really good options behind canola or wheat in, in indifferent and just think if you're growing canola you could be putting double crop seed in the ground next week and that's a good thing is there anything we need to keep in mind in terms of management and getting the ground ready for that second crop? Well, as, as with any double crop system, things are gonna be stressed already. Um, you know, whether you're doing soybeans or sesame or sorghum, we're already a month behind on all of those, essentially. And so what we're having to think of is making sure to minimize stress or else the yields are associated and are not gonna be worth the time. Um, weed management's always a big thing. We see behind us, there's, there's a lot of weed management that has to be done especially with a double crop system when you're talking about something like soybeans glyphosate can typically be put to r2 r2 happens in full season a month and a half down the line and double crop it can happen two or three weeks after emergence so it's something that guys have to be a lot more proactive about especially their weed management fertility management making sure that if you had problem spots in your wheat problem spots in your canola especially in soybeans grain sorghum they're probably going to be problem spots as well now tell us about your research and what you and, the, and your research team are getting organized in this field? Well, this is, this is one thing that, that goes for double crop and beyond. Um, the sugarcane aphid is something that we've talked about for the better part of a year or more here in the state um, and, and in the sorghum growing area, it's, it's been a constant hassle. Um, the thing of it is, is that the best management against sugarcane aphid is planting dates, making sure you get it planted on time. As we talked about with double crop, we don't have that ability to plant in April. We have to plant late season. So this is what this trial behind us is looking at, is looking at a, behind a theoretical canola double crop 
a theoretical wheat double crop as well as a full season sorghum double crop looking at a tolerant so one that uh, a, a hybrid that doesn't necessarily is not as impacted by the sugarcane aphids and then an intolerant one that we know the aphids like to go to and can really do a lot of yield damage and so looking at is there a benefit should we just go ahead and not do behind wheat or behind canola unless you have uh, or are ready to battle the sugarcane aphid well best wishes getting it all set up and then we'll have you back on to tell us what your results how are. How it all goes. <laughs> right. Okay, we'll let you get back in the field. Josh, thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll see you again soon. Well, Brian, it looks like the combine is ready to get off the trailer. Yeah, combines are rolling in Oklahoma right now. So what should producers be thinking about once they get the combine off, cut the wheat, what's the next step for double crop? One of the first things to think about is if you're going into that double crop, what crop is it? What's the fertility behind it? Oftentimes with the double crop, we may not do a lot of fertility. A lot of it's considered a catch-all, just whatever left over. Recent years have had some really good rains, timely temperatures, and our double crops have had some really good yield potential. So if you think about soybean, not a lot you want to do a soybean as far as nitrogen goes. If you do have some potassium or phosphorus issues, deficiencies known about, go ahead and get a little bit of that fertility down to help those beans out and get as much out of them. When it comes to sorghum, and some of the guys are doing double crop corn uh, around here right now, nitrogen fertility really starts coming into play. Typically, a double crop sorghum is just put in to recover whatever's left in the system. After wheat's out though and that straw starts breaking down, that nitrogen gets tied up. So if we're in a good environment with good yield potential, we can really limit what we've got out there if we don't fertilize properly. So think about getting some nitrogen down to get to a, a good yield level for both the sorghum and corn, whatever you're going with. Of course, if you're talking double crop, it's often planted into stubble, right. which makes nitrogen application a little bit more tricky. Mm -hmm. If we can get in the ground, try to find a way to inject it, whether it's liquid, Otherwise, broadcast that urea, try to get in front of a rain, or use liquid with uh, streamer bars or, or something to push that uh, liquid fertilizer down through the stubble. I, I remember back during the heat of the drought a few years ago, you, you, you were saying don't, don't apply nitrogen. Yeah. We've had the rain. Why is that so important now? So one aspect of the rain that we have had is that we've recharged our subsoil. So we have good soil moisture at depth mm -hmm. if we can get a crop established to get it going, which means we have a better benefit. You know, back in the drought, we had no subsoil moisture for that double crop to right. pull from. So now that we have subsoil moisture, all we need is a couple rains to get that crop up and get it going. The bad thing about nitrogen, if it's not incorporated into the soil, is that it needs the rain to get it down. So again, we're in that double crop. If you can get it on in front of the rain, that's best case scenario. Let's talk about, you know, the, the, the application. You do, do you just go out and say, I'm gonna put down this amount or do you test it? You know, with double crop, it, it's really even harder to hit that right rate because mm -hmm. it's in our summer. Right. Our summers are so unpredictable about how much heat and how much rain. You know, looking at our 10 day right now, we still have some rains in the forecast after this dry period. So it looks good. Uh, soil moisture looks good. When I go that, when I look at that, I think let's bump up our yield goal and, and up above what we might think we normally get. However, if you're in an area that's called for a prolonged dry period coming in to the future, then you just kind of sit back. And on some of these double crops, it might be that you plant and when a rain comes, make your nitrogen applications then. Right, okay, so just real briefly, talk about leaching and how, how the nutrients move through the soil. Okay, with nitrogen application, anything that's been applied in the, the fall or spring for the current winter wheat crop has gone from an ammonium form right. into a nitrate form. Mm -hmm. Now, ammonium is not mobile, so it stayed in that area around the surface or wherever it was put in. Mm -hmm. Nitrate is mobile in the soil, so every time we get a rainfall, anything that was left at the end of the wheat crop can be moving down. Luckily with our weather, we aren't likely to get just a whole lot of rain coming up in the future to push it all the way down. Right. So if we've had nitrate move down in the profile a foot or so, as it dries, that moisture is coming back up and it's going to bring nitrate with it. So that nitrate in this double crop is kind of fluxing with soil moisture as that moisture moves up or moisture moves down. One last question on that. Is there, is there a floor to that or will it go to 32 inches? The floor is going to be a restrictive layer or wherever that, that soil stops 
stops draining to. Right. So if we have an increase in clay at depth, somewhere between 18 and 30 inches, it'll, it'll sit on top of that. Right. Uh, if we get some of our, our sandier ground, uh, deeper soils, it can go as far as that moisture goes down. Okay. Well, Brian, I know that you're busy trying to get the crop off and we do appreciate it. Do appreciate it. And go to our website, sun.okstate.edu for any of what we talked about during this segment. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. And Kim, some people estimate Oklahoma's harvest is right about 40% complete. Let's also take a look at how world harvest is progressing. Well, if you look around the world, you've got India, Pakistan, the Middle Eastern countries, North a some countries in North Africa. Their harvests are, are complete already. Uh, on June 1, you've normally uh, got 25% of the world's harvested done. By, by July 1, it's up to 42%. By August 1, it's up to 59%. And when you get out to September 1, we've normally got 80% of the world's uh, crop in the bin. Now you've said before that the wheat marketing price year is determined in that September, October time frame. Does the last 20% say determine the price? Well, it's at the margins what you've got that, and uh, you know, 80%. Uh, you, you know, that that will probably meet our needs for next year. You've also got quality issues coming in. Like we've got a lot of wheat in the bin right now here in Oklahoma when we started this crop. Uh, however. Uh, a good portion of that was low quantity wheat, so the world needed uh, this wheat. So when you get to that 80%, that, that last 20 is very important because it's at the margin and it, it's the one that really determines if the price is going to go up or if the price is going to go down. Now we've seen a pretty decent run up in prices this past week. Does that change some of your price expectations moving forward? No, I, uh, I don't think so. Remember if you'll go back the last couple months, I was predicting $4.25 uh, uh, wheat in central Oklahoma on June 20. Uh, you know, I've been sweating blood on that. It looks like we may be able to hold that price. Uh, the, uh, the reaction to the Wall Street report that just came out, of course, uh, we'll have to see what happens there. But I think my outlook is about the same. I believe that as we approach harvest, out, I mean, planting out this September, that we've got to have the price near the cost of production. Otherwise, producers aren't going to plant the wheat and the market needs the wheat. Remember, I was talking about that poor quality wheat of last year's crop that's in the bin. Uh, we've got this year's to use, they need uh, acres for uh, 2017, and, and to get those acres, they're going to have to raise this price a little bit. Okay, and last but not least, should producers take advantage of these slightly higher prices? A 40 cent price increase, you bet. I think you've got to sell 10, 20 percent when you get a little rally. I think that's the way to sell this crop is when you get a price rally, pull the trigger on some wheat. Okay, Kim Anderson, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. A lot of Oklahoma cow-calf producers that have spring calving operations will breed the uh, replacement heifers just a little bit ahead of the cow herd to give those heifers some extra time next year to, to breed back. That means that the breeding season for the replacement heifers is drawing to a close for, for many herds. So now is a good time, I think, to visit with your local veterinarian about getting those heifers pregnancy tested just as soon as possible in order to find out which of those heifers didn't get bred in this uh, ongoing breeding season. Getting that uh, chore accomplished as soon as possible I think is really, really important. Not only from the standpoint of identifying which of those replacement heifers uh, just for whatever reason didn't get bred and getting them out of our herd, but from the economic standpoint of being able to cull those heifers while they're still young enough to go into the fed cattle market, bring a, a good price when we take them to town as, as open replacement heifers, and save the feed costs and the ownership costs of those cattle throughout the remainder of the summer, the fall, and next winter. You see, if you do the economics on this, uh, that heifer today, if uh, she weighs about 824 pounds, looking at last week's markets in Oklahoma City, that heifer would bring something like $1,037.
If we wait until next spring and find out that as a two-year-old she's open, there was some reason why she couldn't get bread, and we try to sell her then, chances are she's going to bring something only in the neighborhood of about $900. So we lose somewhere around $100 to $150 just in value of uh, that heifer by holding her till next spring to uh, find out that she didn't have a calf. Then when you add in the expenses of feed, pasture costs throughout the remainder of the summer and the winter, you can easily add another $200. In some cases, it may be two to three times that, depending upon your operation. And now you can see that there's a, a rather sizable expense that you have no chance to, to recoup. One of the other reasons why I think it's very critical that we identify those replacement heifers that didn't get bred in this, in this breeding season. This is the easiest time they have in their entire life to become pregnant. Research from the uh, research station up in Montana, one of the USDA stations many years ago, looked at what happened if they kept replacement heifers that didn't get bred and kept them throughout the remainder of their lifetime. You know, those heifers only averaged a 55% calf crop for the time that they spent in the cow herd from there on. That made them a pretty bad bet. So that's why I think it's very important that you go ahead, make the uh, contact with your local veterinarian, schedule a date as soon as they're comfortable with uh, checking your replacement heifers to see which ones got bred this breeding season, which ones are open, and you need to call them as soon as possible. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Now to a conversation about snakes. It's been said by many people that a good snake is a dead snake, but that may not necessarily always be the case. Here's Sunup's Curtis Hare to explain. They slither in all shapes, sizes, and colors, and Oklahoma has a lot of them. Snakes. Just saying the word makes some people squirm, and while summer will move people outside, snakes also will be on the move. Professor Stanley Fox studies and teaches classes about snakes and their behavior at OSU. He says our state is a ripe habitat for snakes that are both non-venomous and venomous. Well, you have a lot of snakes in Oklahoma. It's a very rich snake fauna. Now, most of the snakes are non-venomous and, and uh, harmless in that sense. We have seven species, though, of venomous snakes. We have five species of, of rattlesnakes and two species of venomous snakes that are not rattlesnakes, the copperhead and the cottonmouth, sometimes called the water moccasin. While Oklahomans have long been aware of venomous snakes, Fox says it's hard to tell the difference between the harmful and non-harmful critters, and people often get them confused. Non-venomous snakes can get large, just like rattlesnakes, um, but the main field character that's useful to, to the public is the shape of the head. And if that head is very big and globular, triangle, diamond-shaped or uh, arrowhead-shaped, and then has a very skinny neck afterwards, then it might very well be a venomous snake. However, sometimes some big water snakes can flatten their heads, and they do so, and they, they, they look a lot like a, like a venomous snake. Justin Agin is a third-year graduate student at OSU and studies snakes. He says bull snakes and rat snakes are commonly mistaken as venomous, often prompting a reaction to kill or remove them, which can have consequences. Um, so whenever you try to kill them and try to attack them or get rid of them, that's when most snake attacks actually happen. That's when most people get bit. This is a bull snake. It's a snake that you can find throughout Oklahoma. Um, and like any other snake, one that's often confused for being a venomous snake. But one particular thing that is often confused with bull snakes is one of their defense mechanisms. So whenever they're intimidated or scared or feel they're trapped, um, what they'll do is they'll uh, hiss. And when they hiss, it has this rattling sound that sounds exactly like a rattlesnake. We all know we should be aware of snakes and we're enjoying the outdoors. But experts say if we come across a snake that we think might be poisonous, leave it alone. And if there's one on your property, call animal control instead of trying to kill it. Well, all snakes, even venomous snakes, are important because they, they live a long time. They eat uh, rodents, they eat rats and mice, and, uh, and they help to control 
um, herbivores, the small herbivores like, mat, like mice and rats and birds. Fatal snake bites are very rare in the United States. I think it's probably less than 20 a year uh, people that are actually killed by a snake, venomous snake. Now, a lot of times when the snake bite, strikes and bites, it doesn't inject venom. It's called a dry bite. And that happens about a third of the time. Of course, you can't depend on that. You should still go to the hospital if you know it's a venomous snake. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. We are finally starting to dry out in Oklahoma. A graph of solar radiation from El Reno from June 1st through the 8th shows the lack of sun during the first four days of June and then brighter skies Sunday through Wednesday. That is just what farmers were asking for. Brighter skies, warmer afternoons, and lower humidity so they can get this year's good wheat and canola crops in the bin. A map of rainfall from May 30th through June 8th shows that only two mesonet sites had minimal rain, hooker and slap out in the panhandle. All of the green areas received more than an inch of rain and many more than two inches. We have a new mesonet site in the panhandle, Eva, near the border of Cimarron and Texas counties. Eva is already hard at work. Sunday morning, June 5th, Eva recorded a 48 degree low. On Monday, Eva recorded an afternoon high of 89 degrees, a maximum wind gust of 68 miles per hour, and over an inch of rain. Eva was installed at a new Oklahoma State University research farm that adds new opportunities to study irrigation efficiencies and panhandle cropping systems. Here's Gary with a look at our cool May. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Now, I bet everybody's sick and tired of the hot weather after just about a week. You know, and that's okay. I figure there are normal people like me that love summer, and then there's everybody else. But let's take a look at the May temperatures and see why it's such a shock to our system. This is the departure from normal temperature map for the Mesonet for the month of May, and we can see all those blue colors. Those are much below normal temperatures uh, in those darker blue areas. Ended up being about the 21st coolest May on record, dating back to 1895 across the state, about 2.3 degrees below normal. So what do we see? See as we go out about a week or so into June. Uh, after this hot week, well, we see more warm temperatures, I'm afraid. Uh, this uh, is a probability map from the Climate Prediction Center for June 14th through the 20th, and we do see those increased odds of above normal temperatures across much of the eastern half to two-thirds of the country, including Oklahoma. And we also see increased odds for below normal precipitation across northwest Oklahoma, increased precipitation across southeast Oklahoma, and in the normal range in central Oklahoma. Finally, let's take a look at the elevations for the major reservoirs across the state. All the lakes in the state are doing great except for Foss Lake in far western Oklahoma and then Stanley, Stanley Draper in central Oklahoma. Um, other than that, our reservoirs are doing great. We're in good shape for the summer, ready for any sort of dry conditions that come along, at least in that area. Now, while it's been hot early this summer, that doesn't mean we're going to have an unbearable summer in the, as we go in the next couple of months. So let's just wait and see what we have before we start fearing that hot summer like 2011. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime online at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. We leave you today with some of our first sunup footage of the year of wheat harvest from the Matheson Family Farm at Billings in Noble County. I'm Lyndall Stout. We'll see you next week. I'm the fourth generation. Uh, my dad, Bob, was farming, farming all this prior to that. Um, and then my grandpa, Rex, uh, was prior to him. And then Andrew was the original Matheson that came to Oklahoma. He, uh, he immigrated from Denmark to Beloit, Kansas. And then in the land run, he came down and settled with our home place. 
and then he built the the house and the barns and all the, the that's that's been the main operation since the land run. I've got this year I've got about 850 acres of wheat. I haven't added tickets yet, but the Ruby Lee side of it, I think it's it's going to be in the upper 40s, uh, just on based based off the number of trucks we took to town. This one is my favorite. The red one is my nemesis. They brought his grandpa bought it brand new, and so it's had a lot of drivers. And I actually didn't even know how to drive a standard. So um, Pete's dad and his brother Trenton. Um, taught me how to drive a standard. It's a big deal in the little town. Whoever brings in the first load of wheat gets to be in the paper. So, and for years it was always a certain family. And so last year and this year we got to do it. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Chance and I have been cutting wheat and doing this, gosh, since we were nine years old. We, my dad started this out on the grain cart when we were nine. And uh, so we, the two of us, have been doing this together for quite a few years. And it's fun just to get out and be out in the field working with each other. 